Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. Our topic today is coronavirus, small business guidance, and loan resources. Before we get started, I would like to take a moment to go over a few housekeeping items. My name is Allison, and I will be the webinar organizer for today. We want to make sure today's presentation is extremely valuable for you, so we ask that you submit all questions by clicking on the question button in the control panel and typing your question. We will answer as many questions as possible at the end of the presentation. Right now, please join me in welcoming Joe Roman, President and CEO of the Greater Cleveland Partnership. Hi, Allison, and thanks for the introduction and to your team for setting this webinar up. I know it'll be very helpful. Uh, let me add my thanks to all of you on the call. Uh, so many of you, in fact, for joining this uh, amazing turnout to gain critical information and advice about how to access support from one of our very important partners. And they've been a partner for a long time, the Small Business Administration. In light of these unprecedented, unprecedented challenge facing the economy and so many of your own businesses. And as the Greater Cleveland Partnership and Cozy, we want to be right there with you, helping wherever and wherever we can. Our primary goal is Cleveland's Chamber, one that is proud to have the largest regional group of small businesses in the nation, is to amplify and accelerate the services we were built to supply for you in this critical window of need and opportunity. Our organization is here to provide rapid delivery of timely information and interpretation of that information where needed so you know how to act and access support. Connections like today with key officials at the SBA. Resources through our GCP websites and our in-gear website programs that are designed to be your help ticket in addressing the current problems or roadblocks you are facing. And advocacy here locally and at the state and federal levels to focus public policy and budgetary resources on helping you address the current environment. Part of that is what we'll be discussing today. And most of all, perhaps sharing sharing best practices on many fronts, including ideas to possibly help reallocate some of your capacity and expertise toward emerging needs as we're reading about every day, and perhaps how you are dealing with staff issues and redeployment. By the way, make sure you check out our InGear website and the Now Hiring page if some of your employees are looking for temporary assignments elsewhere. The bottom line is that we want to help you get answers that are practical and usable now. So ask questions of today's panel, and if you can't get it answered now due to this amazing volume on the call, send it to us, as Allison noted. And a GCP staff person, an SBA person, or someone else will be directed to help you address your need as soon as possible. So please enjoy the webinar, and I'm sure there will be more to come. I also want to thank Ray Graves from the SBA, who will be answering a lot of your questions today. He's a great partner and I look forward to listening in. So, Allison, let me turn it back to you. Thank you, Joe. At this point, I'm going to actually turn the presentation over to Ray. Ray, do we have everything working on your end? I think so. Uh, I am starting up my presentation now. Um, give me a second here. Are you able to see that, Allison? Yes, I can. And so can our okay. no pressure. Okay, perfect. So yes, this thank you, Joe. This is Ray Graves with the US Small Business Administration. Um, I am the lead lender relations specialist for uh, the Cleveland District Office. And we want to come on today to talk a little bit about the SBA's response to the crisis, <clears throat> provide what information I can, but I need to frame this a little bit for all of you because um, it's important to understand that I'm a field officer at a local district office. Uh, within the last several days, Congress has passed very aggressive legislation, which the agency that I work for is currently processing and implementing. And we're writing the SOP on some of these programs right now. So we're writing the standard operating procedure. We haven't written them yet. We haven't issued notices. We haven't fully gotten arms around everything that we're going to need to do and how we're going to do it. And the agency needs to make sure that when we have messaging out there, it's authentic and authoritative. Many, many uh, accounting firms and lawyers have decided that because they want to be as responsive as possible to their 
customers, that they're going to provide uh, summaries of the legislation, or maybe they're going to summarize the bill that led to the legislation, or maybe they're going to summarize comments that a congressperson may have made to them uh, in a hallway or something. And I, that's great. Um, but for the purposes of this call, I want to make sure that you understand I'm not going to be able to answer some questions because the only information I've gotten from my agency um, is that these programs exist, but not be able to answer some of the real technical things um, in any way other than what I have read from third party sources. So it's not my place to just sit here and summarize what I've heard from, you know, a, a summary from an accountant or a chamber or something like that. Um, you all can, can get that yourself. But I'm going to do my best to provide the information that I know to be true. Um, I may make some comments on things that I think are likely to be true. And there are going to be a lot of things that I simply am going to say, listen, I can't answer that right now because I don't have that information. But we also acknowledge that misinformation flourishes when there's no information being put out by the agency at all. So I think it's important that we we be present and that we be here and um, you know answer the questions that we can. Um, but there's definitely been quite a bit of information, loads of information put about about the CARES Act. Some of it isn't fully accurate, and it's possible that the implementation of these programs will be different than than perhaps someone expects. So I would just urge everyone before we even get into the rest of the presentation uh, that when they're when they're talking about CARES Act information, just to take a deep breath and know the the agency is working on standard operating procedures and notices in the next week or so, and and look for those to come out. More information will come out, um, but sometimes we don't have the information quite yet on how these things are going to actually land. So hopefully that's understandable. Uh, again, uh, let's let's jump into this and see what we know. So right now um, there is a, a very good disaster assistance website, and I've put it on my screen here. It's a long URL, but it's that coronavirus COVID-19 small business guide and Sloan resources. This presentation can be uh, provided to you by Allison or or by myself. Um, you can click on that, but you can find it other ways as well. That's a long URL to write down. So sba.gov slash disaster is going to get you to the right place as well. Um, the SBA has a wealth of information, especially on the, the top site, the Small Business Guidance Loan Resources site. Um, a lot of that information is what I'm, I'm using today. Um, the sba.gov slash disaster is going to get you right to applying for assistance from the SBA. Um, on slide three, the program that we have right now that's available, and it was available off, to the shel off the shelf uh, you know, before this disaster occurred, is the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program. Um, that was the tool that we had going into this. It's the tool that's most active today, and it's a tool that we continue to buff up and, and advance uh, as time goes on. Economic Injury Disaster Loans are working capital loans directly made by the federal government to small businesses, not-for-profits, landlords, and potentially some other entities to um, help get you over from where you are today to when the crisis ends. It's designed to be a working capital program that's going to provide funding for expenditures a business would otherwise have been able to pay but cannot pay right now due to the crisis. The loans go up to $2 million. The rate is 3.75% for businesses and 2.75% for not-for-profits. Typically, the term to repay these things is going to be 30 years with a full year of deferred payment. So the action there is, is not so much on the interest rate, which is just a normal interest rate in this day and age. The, um, the action is on, on that long amortization you have. Um, working capital loans are typically amortized over five or six or seven years. These are amortized over 30 years without prepayment penalties. So you, in the small business, you have a long time to uh to prepay your to excuse me to pay off that loan very generous terms to keep that payment amount relatively low again small businesses uh landlords most not-for-profits are eligible for this for a small business we're looking for generally businesses under 500 employees um, also there's a make standard that one could could use that references sales standards but most small businesses are easily going to be able to be eligible for this um, Please, new, I'm Ray, I'm so sorry to interrupt you. We have requests. Do you mind sharing your uh, whole presentation? We can see your uh, webinar sidebar right now. Would you mind putting it into presentation mode? Oh, sure. Um, okay. Let's see if we can do I'm that. I'm so sorry to interrupt you. We've had a couple of requests no. for it. Yeah, sure. Um, how do I do that? 
Um, actually, it looks better right now um, because we can't see our webinar sidebar. Um, I think if this, if you can keep it at this, it'll be great. We can still see your next slide. Um, okay. But it's it's an improvement. And oh, someone said you have to take it on presentation mode. Okay. Well, I can try that. Let's see if we can do that. Is that helpful? But luckily, we have a lot of people on, so we can crowdsource. Right. Crowdsource the information. Uh, let's see here. I've got so many different things up on my screen. Um, Hmm. Well, I'm not sure that's really helping matters. Uh, okay, let's well, see here. I can try. Um, and like like we said, everyone, we will be sending the slides out later. Oh, here you go. Is that better? If you go to uh, view, I believe at the top. Okay. I'm so view. sorry. Slideshow. Over. Slideshow. Okay. And should we and now do we current slide? slide? Does that help? Beautiful. I, oh, that's what it was before. Everyone, if this still isn't working, please comment in the questions box because I am reading them as you're putting them in. I think, oh, but we can see our GoToWebinar again. Could you just move that over maybe? Like over here? Yeah, I think. Or maybe I, I can just like minimize it all together. How about this? Yeah, this works. No, leave webinar. I don't want to do that. That would be bad. No, leave it. No, um, please don't sign up. Leave it how you hold now. I think we're good. Um, and like we said, everyone, right. we'll be sending this out. Thanks, Ray. I'm so sorry to interrupt. Go ahead. Sorry. No, no worries. No worries. It's probably better to stop me before I just keep heading downhill completely. Um, <laughs> all right, let me go back. I think I've kind of advanced past where I was. So I was talking about economic injury disaster laws. All right. So are we good to go? Should I keep moving forward, or are we still in trouble? No. Please, please keep moving forward. Thank you. Okie doke. So um, I was talking about the economic issue disaster loan and um, was talking about what was new. So um, new in the CARES Act is this concept of an advance on the loan. The advance is a $10,000 advance on your EIDL award applied for in conjunction with the EIDL loan. Funds, uh, funds will be made available within three days of a successful application and this loan advance will not have to be repaid, which is really very uh, a very generous um, bonus for the EIDL program. If you have already applied for an EIDL, if you applied in version one or version two of the application process, you'll need to go back into the um, newest version three or generation three of the EIDL portal to uh, apply for one of these new um, EIDL advanced loans. And I think you should. Um, it's, it seems like a great deal. Um, and uh, you folks should do that. I know it's going to be a little bit of a pain to go back in and reapply, especially you know when some folks uh, spent hours on the first iteration of their application. But the new, the newest, most streamlined application form, um, people are telling me they can get through in 20 minutes, and there's no uploadings necessary or fewer uploadings necessary. Um, I haven't received training myself on the new um, portal, but I'm told that it's it's much more advanced than it was before. And SBA is just continuing to bring bring along uh, more capacity uh, every day. So I expect the process to be better. But if you want one of the idle advances, the $10,000 um, upfront grant supposedly uh, provided within three days uh, of application, you do need to go back into the portal, um, which is gonna actually have a different URL at this point um, and uh, apply again. So this is for fixed payments, for payroll, for accounts payable, for utilities, insurance, and other types of expenses that, again, a business would have been able to pay uh, on an ongoing basis, on a monthly basis, but for uh, the crisis happening. It's not for dividend payments to ownership or disbursements to owners. It's not to repay a, sh a stockholder loan that's on your balance sheet, except if the stockholder made a loan to the company uh, for the purpose of keeping it going. It's not for fac facility expansion uh, for those businesses that are doing well, like maybe a grocery store or um, you know some kind of medical device manufacturer or something. It's not for that. It's just for working capital that um, we need to get from one side of the crisis to the other. The amounts that you're going to be um, going to be awarded under EIDL are going to be determined by the SBA based on financial information that you provide. 
So it's not a situation where you're you're going to be making a request necessarily, but you would be providing financial information, and the SBA be using that financial information to give you an award um, based on historically what you were able to do. All right, let's see if we can advance the slide without unduly traumatizing the ability to see it. Okay, so on slide four, which I just turned to, the next thing that we've got that ca they came online just last week is the Express Bridge program. So an SBA Express Bridge allows a small business who currently has a business relationship with an SBA Express lender to access up to $25,000 with less paperwork. So your current lender, if they are SBA Express eligible, can make one of these $25,000 loans very easily. The intent here is to give a business a bridge uh, loan until uh, long-term financing can be uh, figured out, whether that's through an idle uh, or through other means. The max term on these is seven years. The max interest rate that we will allow is prime plus 6.5. Hopefully your lender, your lender will provide a better rate. No collateral is needed except a personal guarantee on these express bridge loans. And the lender that is making the loan is authorized to make the loan purely on the basis of SBA's small business credit score, uh, personal credit score, and uh, successful completion of an IRS transcript, which would allow us to just verify that the company um, has been filing taxes. On slide five, I'm coming to some of the newer stuff that it's more tough, more difficult for me to comment on with much detail. The first one is this Paycheck Protection Program, which was in the CARES Act. What we know on this one is that the loan amount is going to be a function of your payroll. So again, the loan amount, the, the determined award amount, would be based on a function of your payroll. Uh, for example, eight weeks of prior average payroll plus an additional 25% of that amount. The loan may go up to $10 million, but I imagine in most cases the bookends will be established by the prior uh, qualification that I just mentioned. Loan payments will be deferred for at least six months. If you maintain your workforce, SBA will forgive the portion of the loan proceeds that are used to cover payroll and pot potentially certain other expenses following loan origination. These will be guaranteed loans made by partner lending institutions. Recall that the Economic Injury Disaster Loan is a direct loan from the government through the SBA's website. The Paycheck Protection Program will be loans made by third-party lenders that the SBA will guarantee 100% of. The maximum interest rate will allow on these is 4%. So the lending institution is going to be able to make a uh, return. Uh, they may have origination fees that are associated that we, we would pay for them for it. Um, they're going to be very uh, incentivized to make these loans with very little risk. And it's going to engage all of the third-party lenders across the country um, that want to participate with this to help get access to capital out to small businesses. So it's going to be a really nice augment to the EIDL program. Um, businesses, not-for-profits, veteran organizations, tribal concerns, sole proprietorships, self-employed individuals, independent contractors, uh, as described in the Small Business Act, with fewer, five, fewer than 500 employees can apply for these Paycheck Protection Program loans. Uh, and business in certain industries that I believe would be uh, considered um, uh, um, 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 like hotel and restaurants uh, could be eligible even if they exceed the size standard of 500 employees. So this is a really nice, uh, another nice, really nice program, but it's not available yet. Yet We expect SOPs and, and notices to be written out in the next uh, five to 10 days. And then I would expect the banks to begin uh, opening it up for, uh, for you soon thereafter. Um, again, we have lots of banks calling us. They're very interested in doing this. It's just a matter of us having to take some time, take a deep breath, and write up our procedures on, on how exactly we're going to uh, fulfill the intent of the legislature uh, on this. Okay, on to the slide six. SBA debt relief is also going to be part of the, um, of the new programs uh, underwritten by the, the CARES Act, and that's going to include uh, SBA paying six months of principal and interest for new 7A loans issued prior to September 27th of this year. SBA is also uh, going to pay principal and interest on current SBA 7A loans for a period of six months. So if you've already got one of our loans, you're going to have some debt relief coming on that. We've been encouraging our lenders to offer deferments of principal or deferments of principal and interest for at least six months on current SBA loans. It uh, looks like the SBA will also be uh, paying payments on those loans for six months. 
The current suite of access to capital options uh, for lenders still exist. 7A, uh, Community Advantage is uh, sort of under the uh, umbrella of the uh, 7A program. The SBA Express program, which is our most uh, common program that we use, uh, is going to be buffed up to a million dollars uh, from 350. So that'll make it easier for lenders to get access to capital out as well. Uh, the 504 program uh, is an excellent program uh, for fixed assets and could be used to refinance a basket of of long-term debt with current inter interest rates over a 25-year period. So that could provide some relief to folks who have uh, want to you know, rationalize and bundle up their long-term debt and refinance it. Uh, Micro-lending uh, might also be uh, a way for, uh, for micro-businesses to move forward as well. Um, all of these things are available too. Um, on to slide eight, what I'm showing you here is the correct uh, third generation uh, point of access for economic injury disaster loans. Um, if you have applied again previously, uh, you don't need to apply again unless you want to get access to the uh, Idle Advanced 10,000 um, grant, and I think most people would. So make sure you end up at covid19relief.sba.gov. Uh, there's multiple ways of getting there, but this is the streamlined process that we've got now. And again, I'm told that it's it's much more streamlined than in the past. Some facts uh, that, that I've had uh, doing these presentations so far. Um, are startups eligible? Yes, uh, they, they have been considered eligible for idle awards. It's gonna be a little bit more difficult to present information showing that you have ongoing obligations that you would have had the ability to pay but that you're no longer able to pay um, if you don't have those historical financial results. But the fact that it's more difficult doesn't mean it's not eligible. Uh, so you should be eligible for an idle. Um, it may be possible that um, pure startups aren't going to be eligible for the idle advance because otherwise people would just start up a business and ask for a grant. Um, so I think for the grant, uh, the idle advance grant, you do have to be in business for for some period of time uh, already. How much should be asked for? Again, you're not asking for an award so much as you are providing financial information that's going to determine your award under idle. What if I don't have enough collateral? Well, collateral is not a reason for a decline. Uh, under the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program. So don't worry about that. What do you need to do with your bank? Nothing. EIDL is a direct loan from the government, but you should be in contact with your financial institution about a deferment uh, and about the potentiality for the SBA's um, loan uh, relief or lend, uh, uh, debt payment relief. Um, how much does it cost? No fees for an EIDL. Uh, is there a prepayment penalty? No. Uh, so if you've asked me, if I have a line of credit available, does that mean that I'm not eligible for an economic injury disaster loan? No. If you've been adversely affected by the crisis and you're concerned about making your payments, we want you to apply. For additional questions, you can reach out to the SBA's Disaster Assistance Customer Number at 800-659-2955. Again, 800-659-2955. Uh, we are uh, bringing uh, way more capacity online to answer these calls. Um, many contract employees are gonna be added that will allow us to answer the, the phones uh, very in, in a hurry compared to where, where we've been with you know hours long delays. Um, there's gonna be a tier one and a tier two uh, set up like many call centers where the first tier is gonna be um, you know new, newer brought on contractors and then if you need a tier two help, it'll go to an SBA employee or someone from FEMA potentially who, who will be trained up on our, our programs as well. You can also email disastercustomerservice at sba.gov for additional uh, detail. At our district office, you can reach us at 216-522-4180. You can reach me at 216-522-4192 or email me at raymond.graves at sba.gov. And I think that is the last slide that I had, um, and I can try to take your questions now. Again, just acknowledge if it's something about the PPP uh, or about some of the newer provisions from the CARES Act, um, I'm limited in how much I can, I can really say. Allison, did you want to read some of the Thank questions? You, Ray. Yes, I am so sorry. I was talking on mute. Uh, it's one of those <laughs> days, apparently, for all of us. Um, we are going to turn the 
presentation over to Regan Leatherman right now at GCP. She's been gathering everyone's questions that were either submitted prior to the webinar or as you've been speaking, Ray. Uh, Regan, it's your turn. You're up. Hi. <laughs> okay, so we have a few questions here. Um, a couple of, uh, we do have an EDO question. So a small business experienced a temporary spike when COVID hit, but their business has dropped off this week and they expect revenues to continue declining. Should they apply now or wait until they have a few weeks of reduced revenue behind them? They should apply now. I think the, the amount of the idle award is going to be based on historical financial inf information. Um, <clears throat> so like potentially the application, and again, I haven't memorized how it works, but I think it's going to ask you currently, like, what was last year's <clears throat> gross revenue and gross profit? And I imagine the award will be based off of last year's financial results. <coughs> okay. Um, and on uh, that one, uh, is there a gross profit margin range that is acceptable with the idle? No, I, there isn't. You know, there's size standards. So if a company is so big that it couldn't uh, be considered small, then you might not be able to get an idle. So if someone is uh, got 700 employees or something like that, you might not be able to be eligible. But otherwise, there isn't like a gross profit that we're looking for. What I'm trying to say is you're going to enter financial information into the application, and that information will be used to determine what your award will be uh, under idle. So, you know, a huge business that has a half million dollars in gross profit, um, you know, might get a larger award than someone that reports that last year they had $10,000 in gross profit. Now, it has to be true, so I want you to use the real information, but that's kind of that's kind of why I'm, I'm referencing that anyway, because it's it's useful to determine what your award would be. <clears throat> okay, uh, when will I hear back from the SBA on the disaster loan application? Mm -hmm. So IDLE uh, has been available for, what, three weeks now. Uh, we've gotten tens of thousands of applications. Uh, it's a little premature for us to figure out what an average turn time is on one of these things. Um, what I have been telling everybody is that it's a 30, you know, a 30 day process, uh, you know, at least. I, I would think within, say, three weeks, you'll hear back from somebody and then there's going to be processing time as far as figuring out how to get your, your award to you. Now, the exception with that is within the last three days, we've come up with this concept of the idle advance where people who um, apply for an idle and, and go through the, you know, the current website that was uh, stood up this, the, today or yesterday um, can also check the button to say that, yes, I'm interested in an advance on my idle loan. The advance is going to be placed as a grant. Uh, it could be up to $10,000. And that is supposed to be delivered within a matter of three days. And we'll see how that, that comes out, but that's the intention. And if you need money right away, I definitely would advise you to go back in and, and make sure you're applying for the idle grant as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, really quickly, could you put up a slide 10 of your presentation so people can see the, the numbers while we're going over the questions? Perfect. Um, okay, I have a couple of the Paycheck Protection Program, which we might not be able to get um, full answers, but um, do we have to keep all employees on payroll to qualify? Um, you know, that's one of those questions that gets into the detail of how that program is going to, to work out. And I've received document after document from well-meaning accounting firms and well-meaning attorneys explaining how it's going to work out based on their reading of the legislation. I would prefer just from my standpoint to wait until SBA releases notices and standard operating procedures that then inform the lenders about how this will work. But in general, from what I've understood, um, your forgiveness amount on the PPP loan is related to you are keeping people employed. And if you reduce your payroll, my guess is it would reduce the forgiveness amount. And then the remaining balance that you may have on that, that loan would be paid off over a period of, of uh, some years. Uh, but it's getting into a little bit more detail than I'm comfortable supplying because what the detail I'm providing right now is based on, you know, just my readings of the exact same things y'all are reading. And that's not really very helpful for me to be be restating. Sure. Um, also, kind of along that vein, if they already have furloughed employees, can they still apply for a small business loan that becomes a grant if they put all the employees back on payroll? 
Um, so the question is, if someone already laid off their employees, could they apply for a loan that becomes a grant if they pe put people back on payroll? Um, Correct. So for, for idle, it's it, you don't get forgiveness in idle based on putting, you know, based on payroll. So you're really sort of talking about the PPP program, which I can't really talk about, um, which the details haven't emerged from. But you know, the overall intention of that program is for businesses to to keep people on payroll. So okay. I'm I'm thinking that that putting people back on payroll is is the way you're going to get to uh, the forgiveness amount. But please wait for um, actual notices and SOPs to be released by the SBA to determine how this will be done. Okay. It's not um, available. Is there today. a difference? Hmm? Is there a difference between SBA loans and SBA COVID nineteen loans? Yeah, so a traditional SBA loan is uh, either a 7A or a 504 or a microloan. A 7A is a bank loan guaranteed by the SBA. Um, a 504 is where SBA is guaranteeing a debenture sale, and a microloan is where we, re we lend money to uh, a not-for-profit, in this case ECDI, to relend to, to folks that maybe can't qualify for a traditional loan. Um, under the COVID-19 crisis, we're supplying economic injury disaster loans which are direct loans from the federal government, which is different than a conventional SBA loan. These direct loans from the government feature some interesting things like working capital that you can you know, pay back over 30 years, which you could never do with our traditional loans. It also features uh, this potential $10,000 advance grant, which is not part of our traditional program. Um, the PPP is something that we just created uh, a few days ago, and that is nothing like a traditional SBA loan in that it's 100% guaranteed by the SBA. It's got some other really nice features to it, um, you know, around whether you know collateral is required and guarantors are required. Um, it has that forgiveness feature, which is nothing like a, a traditional SBA loan. Um, so, yeah, they're they're not the same. Okay. Um, I do have one that says once they completed an idle application, they can't get back into the application and edit their information if there is an error. Is there a way yeah. for them to do that? Not that I know of. That's not a very satisfactory answer, but that's the answer that I have. <laughs> if you've got something that, like let's say you submitted something and you weren't able to upload a document because you didn't have it. So you went to bed and you know you were submitted pending, uh, pending uh, documents or something was your status. I don't have a, I don't, I don't know now that there's any way for you to get back in anymore because we're now on the third generation of the portal. But what I can tell you is that the third generation of the portal is much easier to use. Start over, get your application in, select the option for uh, an advance uh, grant if that's what you want, and I'm not sure why you wouldn't. Um, and just, just go ahead and do it. It'll take you, you know, much less time than your original application submission. And, uh, you know, I, we certainly regret <laughs> that there's been three generations of this portal at this point, but we're getting better at it and we're, we're advancing the ball on it. We're making it easier and it is a disaster and that's why it's a disaster. Um, so, yeah. Okay. Um, is idle an option for companies with significant expenses over the last year and was set to start revenue in April, 2020? Um, example, breweries. So, what's the implications to a company if they're over a year old but pre-revenue? Mm. Um, I would urge you to apply, but it is definitely going to be tougher for you to get an award when you're not going to be able to show any historical profitability or ability to repay. Um, but I would still urge you to apply. I'm not one of the people that actually adjudicates these loan requests. Um, so I would say apply and, and, and see what you can do. But yeah, it's going to be tougher if you've been, let's say you reopened for the last year and your 2019 shows, you know, no revenues and a million dollars of expenses. Um, that's going to be a conversation. Hopefully you're going to have, have to be able to have with your, with your, uh, with a loan officer that's assigned to you. In the meantime, um, certainly you be, should be talking to your, your current lender about relief. Um, if you have an SBA loan already, the debt relief provisions of that could save you because it sounds like SBA is going to be making payments for people on their, their 7As um, and potentially other loan programs as well. Um, that situation. Okay. 
Um, another idle question. Uh, so uh, let's say a restaurant stayed open during the first few weeks of the crisis, but chose to voluntarily close this week due to business and employee safety. Are they still mm -hmm. eligible uh, for an idle to cover things like utilities and insurance while they're self furloughed yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, they should apply. Um, and then does applying for an idol affect the eligibility for the PP uh, paycheck protection loan? Um, will they eventually be merged or can you get both? Well, they're, they're not merged. They're completely different. So, you know, one is a direct loan from the government. The other one would be an SBA guaranteed loan from a financial institution. Does one affect the other? Yes, most likely. But we're starting to get into the weeds there that I don't have procedures on. What I can tell you I think will be the case. Um, you know, is that if you get an idle grant, um, you may have that grant sort of offset on the forgiveness of the PPP, potentially. Uh, let's let's say that's potentially possible. It may also be possible that um, you'll be forbidden from using an idle and a PPP for the exact same thing. So you couldn't like apply for an idle for the purpose of paying June's rent. And then also pay, apply for a PPP for June's rent. That would be, you know, fraudulent, I suppose. Um, but you should be able to apply for different things. It may be possible that if you don't take an idle out and you get a PPP, it's possible that you would have some conflict in trying to get an idle in the future. But those are the kinds of details, exactly the kinds of details that you need to wait for guidance on. Um, attorneys and accountants have been putting out stuff on that. I don't know what's correct right now. Okay. I would say this, um, if your business is, is, is negatively affected, I would urge you to apply for idle and not like not apply because you think something better might be coming along. I would say, you know, go ahead and get in the queue. Um, you probably won't get, you know, an idle loan for some time anyway. It'll be several weeks. You could always refuse that if it came through, but you know, getting a, you know, getting that 10,000 or whatever the grant ends up being, through idle could be something that could save your business today. So let's not wait. I would I would go ahead and apply. Okay. Um, someone received a recent email suggesting that the CARES loans are going to be administered by their participating bank. Do they still need to go to the SBA and do an idle or can they work with their bank? They can work with their bank. Um, that That is absolutely the case that the PPP loans will be administered by banks um, remember that the PPP loan is going to be a function of some short-term period of payroll. So let's say your payroll is, you know, $100,000 over the, you know, over say, you know, 75 days or something like that. And then your loan is going to be some function of that. Whereas the uh, idle is a direct loan from the government, and the award amount is is calculated differently. So they're different animals, very different. One is directly from the government, one is administered by banks, one is forgivable uh, potentially, one of them has this uh, advanced grant associated with it. Um, if you prefer to go wait for the PPP, you, you certainly can do that. Um, and, and I'd have to you know, leave it to your, your, your uh, advisors to, to consider one or the other. But again, like I said before, I think not doing an idle that you could do today in the hopes that you know, the PPP is available on Monday, I don't know if it's going to be available, you know, when it's going to be available, and I don't know how it's going to be adjudicated and, and what the SOP is going to be on it, but it, we hope it's going to be good. It looks good. So if you get the idle advance and then decide not to take that loan but take the payroll loan, is the 10000 still forgiven? Uh, the $10,000 is, is, is a grant, um, so it's, it's not a matter of it being forgiven. If you get the grant and then you don't take the idle, um, every indication I've seen so far is that it's not going to be recalled or anything like that. Um, but potentially, potentially, it could be that 10,000 could be an offset against your uh, PPP forgiveness, potentially. We do not have the procedures on PPP yet, so I don't know if that's the case. Are 501c7 organizations eligible for the EDL program? Uh, I don't know what a 501c7 is, so I'm sorry, I don't know the answer to that. Um, for businesses who have closed but will reopen, are they still eligible for the forgivable loans to cover payroll? 
Um, I, again, I think the overall intention of the program is for small businesses to, to rehire, so um, potentially. Um, we get a lot of the PPP uh, questions, which we'll try to answer a little bit later, just because we don't have all of the details. Yeah, I, I apologize that we just don't have the PPP information right now. But again, I thought it was important to at least, you know, be present. Um, we'll just have to do another uh, webinar uh, with Cozy and GCP as soon as that information is known. And I'm sure the agency will be, you know, doing some heavy marketing on that and making sure the lenders are well educated because the lenders are going to be the ones doing those loans. Um, so again, just be patient. The, the program's not available yet. Um, it's just going to be something that we're going to have to figure out in the next next uh, week to 10 days. Okay. I do have a couple more idle. Uh, are you able to, to apply for the idle if you haven't filed your taxes for 2019 yet? Yes. That was a quick answer. <laughs> um, Sometimes I actually am quick, yeah. <laughs> Can IDLE be used to purchase new equipment such as computers, et cetera? No. Okay. Um, when will an IDLE loan start to accrue interest? Starts accruing interest uh, right away on the on the note date. Um, interest is accrued through that first year and then paid out, like I said, over the next 30 years. Unless something um, changed with the CARES Act, which is also possible, um, you know. But but as of like four days ago, that was the answer. The CARES Act is okay. you know a game changer in a lot of ways. Billions of dollars are, are are being applied. So if so if I'm if I'm four days behind, you'll have to forgive me on that. But generally, I think that the intention of the program uh, originally, as it was set up, was the interest would accrue. Um, okay. And somebody that applied for an SBA uh, coronavirus loan on March 21st. And they applied again yesterday with a streamlined application. So they have two different application numbers. Will that make a difference or cause confusion? Um, I don't know that. Um, I know many people are in that scenario because, um, you know, they maybe they weren't sure whether they had submitted or they want to go back and apply for an idle advance. So they know they have to do it again. Um, the SBA is going to have to figure that out. Um, I'm sure that many people are in that scenario. Uh, will it cause confusion? Uh, potentially, I hope not. I think you know we, we are probably, hopefully, knock on wood, uh, going to marry up those applications uh, through through some means and and make sure we've got them both in hand. Um, is it possible to apply for an idol and include payroll as part of the expenses? Yeah, you can use an idol for payroll expenses. And if they're not seeing revenue decrease yet, uh, but worried it might happen in April or May, should they just go ahead and apply for the SBA loan now or wait? Um, I don't know if I can really answer that. I, I, I guess I would encourage people to uh, apply as soon as they, they know that they're going to be adversely affected. Um, <clears throat> you know, an idol is a loan, so it's not for the most part, except for that advanced part. Um, so, you know, people have to be, be cognizant of not getting a loan when they don't need one. Are you allowed to pay back uh, the loan early? <laughs> yes. Okay. Will applying no for debt relief cause, will applying for debt relief cause ineligibility for the idol? Not that I know of. I, I don't, yeah, that's another CARES Act thing. So the policies and procedures around debt relief haven't been, um, haven't been lifted, haven't been given to me yet, but I've never heard any connection between um, the universal debt relief that, that is promised in the CARES Act and the ability to apply for EIDL. Do churches qualify? Well, you know, that's a really interesting question. And the guidance I had up to yesterday was that churches would not be eligible. But um, I was on a call with uh, Representative Fudge yesterday, and, and she indicated that it was her understanding that churches would qualify. The new portal version three uh, references something about faith-based organizations. And so at this point, 
Um, I think it's still maybe potentially a little ambiguous, but you know, Representative Fudge is certainly a, a qualified source. So I would urge um, faith-based organizations to apply um, until we know different. And uh, when we know different, if we know different, then COSI and SBA will try to get the word out on it. But again, IDLE is, is there to you know, cover you know, a, a period of time of working capital that you need. So if you're not able to, to you know, bring in your normal donations or you know, your, your payments for your daycare or whatever it is, it's gonna be for that, that temporary, hopefully temporary period. So we found out too that a 501c7 is a nonprofit social club. So if the question is, are nonprofit social clubs eligible? I don't know the specific answer to that either. Um, you know, many the, the words that I that I get is most not for profits are are, are eligible for idle, um, and I would urge you to apply if you are affected by this disaster and uh, you, you know you, you you're worried about ability to pay. I would apply for idle, and I would keep an eye out for for the details on PPP as well. Okay, can the uh, cost of goods sold on the loan application include payroll and subcontractor expenses? That is a very detailed question. So what is in cost of goods sold? Usually <laughs> in cost of goods sold, you put um, your direct costs of production. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if how, how closely SBA is monitoring whether you're you're maintaining uh, appropriate accounting guidelines. I don't, I don't, I didn't even know if it was looking for cost of goods. Maybe it is. Um, so usually it's direct cost of production uh, or direct costs of services, and excludes salaries that are are you know overhead salaries that don't don't change in relation to the actual unit production volume. <laughs> That's all I can answer on that. <laughs> I, I uh, this kind of leads into that. Uh, is there a resource for helping the businesses actually apply because they feel like they need a coach for the paperwork? Yeah, small business development centers are doing that work. Um, here in Cleveland, we're fortunate to have a variety of really good ones. Uh, on the near west side, there's Randy Cedeno's group at the Hispanic Business Center. Um, on the east side, there's the Heights Small Business Development Center, which Katie Van Dyke works for. Um, she also has offices at CSU. Um, downtown, there's uh, the Urban League. Uh, Shoshana Duckworth uh, runs that organization, and all of them have been more heavily involved than I have about, you know, like sitting with people and sharing screens and going through the applications. But remember, those folks are, are new too um, to this new process. No one even knew what this was for you know, like two weeks ago, so everyone is learning on the fly. Um, but they'll have had more experience with the actual screens of the application than potentially I have. Okay, a um, couple more here. If um, the payroll is, uh, can you include the payroll on an idle if the owner is the only employee and they pay themselves using end of year profit? Um, my understanding is that idle is based on, the idle award is based on, um, you know, the financial information that you provide. Um, so you'll get an award based on, you know, your sales and gross profit margin and gross profits that you've generated in, in a given year and then it's a working capital loan that can be used for for business purposes um, i guess that's, that's all i really want to say about that and what happens if you do an idle or a ppp if the business eventually fails hmm um, the, on the PPP, that detail, um, I, I don't have, I, I, I'm understanding that with the PPP, it's, it's potentially could be non-recourse, but it, it's, uh, I, I don't have that information for idle, at least until several days ago, uh, I, I thought there was, what I understood is that there was going to be a personal guarantee on idle loans, um, and potentially collateralization as well. The CARES Act may have changed some of that. Um, so to be, uh, to, 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 you know, keep an eye out for more information on that. Um, again, as of like last week, the answer I would have given you would be pretty clear that if you don't pay back the idle, you do have a personal guarantee associated with it. Um, and you do have potentially collateral associated with idle loans over 25,000. If something on that has changed, it wouldn't surprise me, but I don't have the detail on the, the CARES Act uh, here today. 
Okay, is there somewhere where they can easily get a list of information that's required to apply for an EIDL loan so they have it already when they're filling out the paperwork? The the application portal I'm told is is easy enough now that I don't know if you're going to have a lot of information that's available or that that's needed to upload. For example, in the past we've been asking people to prepare their their business tax return, their personal tax return, their personal financial statement, their debt schedule, and the SBA Form Five or Five C. Um, but I am not sure whether in the third generation of the portal any of those things are being asked for at application. Um, but still, like if I was getting set to sit down on my computer and apply for one of these things, I would be sure to have my financial information beside me because if the portal asks something like, what was your gross profit in 2019, I would want to know what it is, and I would want to make sure that it was verifiably the, the, the same number I put on my tax return. Um, I have a question from a construction company that they slowed some and they have four people uh, that they laid off the rest, which is seven people have been working. Should they apply for any loans? Could they get a partial payroll? What, what would you recommend that they proceed? If they have obligations in the next, you know, 12 months or six months that they think that they're going to run out of money to pay, then they should apply for EIDL. Um, if they, uh, you know, would like to, to uh, you know, have, have a, a notion to rehire some employees and, and keep going that way, uh, the PPP that's that's upcoming could be something they would want to look into. If they have the ability to to keep going and they don't, you know, need a loan, um, and they, they can kind of make ends meet based on what they have, you know, they're gonna have to make a decision there, but getting a loan, you know, an idle loan, maybe isn't the best deal for them if they can kind of continue on without, by just getting lean and, and not, uh, you know, and not getting a loan, that maybe would be better off. But they'll have to make that decision based on, you know, their consultation with their CFO or their financial advisors and try and figure out what's best for them. Okay, we just have a couple more. Um, is the PPP or EIDL, which one specifically is forgivable? forgivable? Okay, the PPP has uh, some forgivable uh, aspects to it. Um, to the extent that uh, someone uh, maintains employment, uh, they should be able to have a portion of their loan forgiven uh, or potentially all of it forgiven, but there's going to be details that are forthcoming about the PPP, which we don't have right now. Um, on the EIDL, there's a potentiality to apply for an advance grant up to $10,000 as a portion of your EIDL uh, award. Okay. Um, if someone was denied an SBA loan previously, would they be denied for an EIDL? Um, they say the credit is good, but their debts are high. Um, potentially. Uh, ability to pay is something that we're considering with EIDLs. Uh, it's not the intention to to fund businesses that that would have failed anyway, but rather to fund businesses that were doing just fine and can't make their payments because of the crisis. Um, so I think uh, ability to repay is going to be looked at in a very quick way, probably through means of you know credit checks or something like that, um, and the financial information you provide to us. So if you were de denied for an SBA loan before. Um, it's possible you would be denied for an idol, but I still would absolutely encourage you to apply because they are different programs. Uh, it's much different as far as analysis goes. It's a direct loan from the government rather than a guaranteed loan from a lender. Um, so I would I would absolutely urge you to apply. Okay, and uh, last question here, and then anything we didn't answer, we will try uh, regarding the PPA. We'll we'll definitely try to get some stuff around. Um, as more information comes out. We are also hosting this webinar again on Thursday. Um, but the last question is the 10,000 included in the loan's principal balance, balance or is it a true grant? The information that I've gotten on that, and this is a CARES Act thing as well, which, you know, again, is, is not, I haven't been provided with the details, but the intention is that that 10,000 would be an advance on your loan and that $10,000 would be uh, for well, it would be a grant. Um, it's an advanced grant on the loan, and it may, you know, as far as the taxation of that, uh, I think I would defer that to uh, your accountant how that would work. But uh, you know, from what I've read, it, it may be tax-free. But I just I don't know. It's that's the kind of detail that we simply don't have on on the new provisions yet. 
Um, the advanced grants is another creation of the CARES Act, which I don't have information on. Okay, perfect. At this point, I'll turn it on over to Allison, uh, and we'll get finalized for today. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Reagan, for moderating, and thank you, Ray, for so much information. Obviously, this is this is a very engaging topic. Uh, thanks again to Ray for sharing everything today, and thanks to all of you for participating in today's webinar. Watch your inbox. We will be sending everyone a recording of the webinar as well as Ray's slides. We hope you found this webinar engaging and informative. If you have any thoughts to share, please reach out to us and let us know. And this concludes today's session. Thanks again.